The Phase 1 XT with the IQ4 150 megapixel digital camera back is not for the faint of heart. Hi everybody, it's Kevin Raver, downtown Indianapolis with Michael Durr. We're having some fun on a beautiful spring day working with the Phase 1 XT camera system. That's a 150 megapixel camera system and this is a gorgeous camera. It's expensive, but it's unique, it's different, and it has a lot of cool tools that I want to share with you briefly and you can read the article for more details on some of these as well as some of the screenshots of the menus and so forth. But uh, this is technically a technical camera. Um, phase One makes two different cameras, the XF, which is more or less a rangefinder camera, typical of the cameras we're accustomed to, and then a technical camera like this. And what I love about a technical camera is it allows me to enter another phase of photography that I love so much, and rather than being spontaneous and shooting real quick and you know machine gunning the shots all over the place, this is a contemplative camera. I set it up on a big tripod. I have a unique ball, quick three pod here, and this is a very, very sturdy tripod with actually two ball heads built in, and we'll cover that in a review in, uh, sometime in the next month or so. Um, and with this, I have a 32 millimeter lens, the camera body itself, and the IQ4 digital camera back on the back. And so all those are the three parts that put, put together, snap together as modules to make this camera uh, work this way. And the nice thing about the XT camera, unlike some of the older technical cameras where you had to actually sync the back to the lens, is it's now all done internally through a new shutter mechanism, uh, all the electronics going through the camera itself and into the back, and it's all controlled from the back. It's very, very effective and uh, super nice to, to work with. So let's take a look at how this all works. I have a, a duck in the background here that's telling me how to actually do my shot. There's a lot of settings, but everything is done really in a simple fashion. When you turn the system on, you have four buttons over here, or you can work with the touch screen. And it's going to present us with a, you know, a default starting point here. So now I have a start screen, which allows me to do all the camera settings. I have it set on manual, 640th of a second at F11 at ISO 100. So you can also go to P for professional, but uh, you know it's a programmable mode. Um, S for shutter priority and A for aperture priority. So you have those abilities to do what you want. This is not an autofocus camera, so you must focus using the knob and the ring on the front of the lens. So typically what I do is I go into live view mode, which is the uh, little camera icon. And once I'm in the little camera icon, I can compose my shot and I have focus peaking turned on and we're working with 
a magnifier like this, much, not much unlike going underneath the black cloth of the magnifier on a view camera, I can take a look at my image, make my composition, and see that it's in focus. I have focus peaking set to green so that anything in green will be in focus. And um, with a 32 millimeter lens, they kind of have a pretty good depth of field. So you can get a lot of depth of field, say with F11 or F16 with uh, that particular lens. And you can always double tap and look at an image 100% and you can scroll around very simply the image by just using your finger. So it's all one touch. To go back to ground zero and back to reset, you can go right there and select where you want. I'm back on live view at this point. You have really cool histograms with this. So you get a histogram when you shoot the shot, but you also have raw histogram with a, a clipping. So you're actually reading the raw image histogram rather than the JPEG histogram like you do with many of the um, mirrorless and DSLR type cameras. So it's a real handy kind of way to do things. And you can see your histogram in the upper left corner when you're setting up your shot. So it makes life very, very easy. Now, when I'm in shoot mode, I can slide from the right with my finger and I have a number of different things. I can display my histogram. I can just set up my focus peaking. I can do my grid and I have a level. And you can make any one of these go full screen by just touching on them. But what I like most right now is frame averaging. Now frame averaging to me is magic. And I have a whole article on frame averaging. And what frame averaging does is allow you to do long exposures without having to use a neutral density lens. Say you've got clouds or you've got water or something that you want to smooth out and you know the time frame for doing that. A lot of times you can judge by watching how fast the clouds are moving through it or just experience will tell you how. Using the exposure that I already determined was the correct exposure, which shows over here at a 640th of a second F11 ISO 100, I'm all set to take the picture. I push this button. Five, four, three, two, one. I am now exposing. And I'll expose for roughly a minute. And I'm going to try to get the water, which is blowing a little bit, to smooth out. Uh, in this particular image. There's a bar graph that goes across the screen and uh, tells you the percentage of the exposure that's complete. Once the exposure is complete, the camera will take all those exposures, blend them together, and create one raw file that's essentially the same effect you would get by doing a real long exposure with a neutral density filter. So you can set this thing up and do a three minute exposure and all these people are walking back and forth during the exposure. And because they're moving the whole time and not staying in place, they basically get erased out when all the images are put together and uh, stacked and combined together. So essentially, you can make a building look like it has no traffic at all or a highway or anything that has motion as long as the motion's moving through and not staying put in the frame. Pretty cool. It's got another cool shot where essentially it takes two images. So what it does is looks at the uh, scene that you have exposed and then overexposes the scene by three stops and then you get both those exposures combined together. This is really handy, for example, if you're shooting inside and you want to uh, have the exposure outside the window match the inside. It just enables you to have a large dynamic range and you can make the adjustments in uh, Capture One. So uh, that's a, a very, very cool effect. It also has uh, bracketing built in, so you can go into a menu and you can set your bracketing. So I want to do five exposures at two stops difference. Once I set the main exposure, all I've got to do is click the shot and I get five exposures. That's real good for exposure blending or the old fashioned HDR. Now, the other thing about this kind of camera is it's got shifts. So I've got two knobs, silver knobs here, and there's little dials here and I can move these up and down till I hit a zero position. So I have a, uh, a raise and a fall, rise and a fall kind of thing. And this helps correct perspective and uh, also allows you to do stitching. So I can go up and, and shoot a shot and I can drag it down and shoot a shot and then combine those exposures to get a bigger exposure right together. So that's very effective also. You do have to be careful when you set the camera up. And of course, once again, experience will teach you this very quickly, is that sometimes on a backpack and if you're moving, some of those shifts could change. So you want to make sure that each time you set your camera up, you at least start at a neutral position, which is zero. 
Let me show you some of the lenses that come with this camera. This is the 90 millimeter F5.6 Rodenstock lens. Beautiful piece of engineering. The optics from the Rodenstock are uh, second to none. And all the lenses are color coded. So you'll notice that the front of each lens has a color. It could be green, blue, this one's yellow. And essentially it snaps into the camera this way. Because it's windy and stuff, I don't want to expose the sensor out here. Um, but you can see all the pins here, okay, that register uh, into the electronics and sync into the, the digital back. There's two clips, one here and one here, and then a secondary safety switch. So essentially you undo those two clips, push this button in, and then pull downwards on the lens and it comes out. And then you put the new lens on, bring down the clips, and everything snaps together, and that's how you change the lens. And the sensor is right there smack in the middle there's hardly any distance to probably that much distance between the rear element of the lens and the sensor so that's how this works now there's a focusing knob here you can on this particular one you got a a knurled knob but you also have Sorry. little stubs here that you can uh, focus with and this box here is the uh, shutter mechanism replacing the copal shutter so there's no cocking of the shutter no you have electronic shutter or the leaf shutter uh, options with this particular camera also. So you can do an electronic shutter or in, in what we do here is a leaf shutter. So that's uh, another great option. And uh, these are some of the different ports back here. Let me open up the port here. So in that port, you'll see there's two different, the XQD card and an SD card slot. Uh, and uh, you can program the camera to work with those in different ways. Um, make one primary and one secondary, JPEGs on one, same shots on both, whatever you'd like. We start down here, we have a multi-pin port, which can be used for a remote and uh, other things. Um, we have the standard flash PC port, and so you can sync to your, your flash and do flash photography. Ethernet port, so if you're shooting tethered, you can use uh, Ethernet cable and shoot tethered. I have an HDMI and a USB-C, and these are spring-loaded little doors, so they keep the dirt out, and when you, you push it in and connect them, they just kind of go in and connect that way. So uh, those are the connection points, and of course, we have a battery compartment on the bottom. And of course, this would connect directly to your laptop or your uh, desktop computer uh, through whatever wire and connection method you want, and whatever you shoot here, you can be tethered to capture one and be capturing the images at the same time. There's a built-in uh, shoe here so that you can use an Arca Swiss mount on almost any tripod you want. Uh, but you also can rotate the camera without having to take it off and move it. So, for example, I can undo this knob and that is pretty awesome. we just <laughs> twist the camera until it stops and lock it back in place. Now, one more time with all these different switches. Anything I can do touchscreen, I can also do with any one of these buttons. So that if I'm out in a cold environment um, and I can't touch the screen, I can also do any of the maneuvering I need to do with uh, gloves on and touching these buttons. So as this camera is tilted and different things along the way, uh, those show up in the uh, display. So I'll get a complete information display at, at the very bottom here. If I want to take a look at all my images, I can go to thumbnail and scroll through all the thumbnails. I can tap on one and go see it. Tap, double tap, and go to 100% and maneuver it around to see how it looks in focus. So it's all touch done and it's all relatively very, very easy to do. So the one of the things I've been working with a lot is the viewfinder app. And the viewfinder app pops up and it allows me to essentially set the camera and the lenses that I have, and it allows me to look at a frame live and determine what lens I would need to shoot the shot. And then I can take a picture just as reference. So what I did was I went around to a lot of different areas, and what I was going to do is go out shooting on a day where I had really good clouds, but I decided so I wouldn't waste time, I would go to a couple locations that I wanted to, which were some historical buildings and the bridge and so forth, and use this app and not only determine the vocal length of the lens I wanted to use, and as we're sitting under here in the bridge, you can see that I'm looking at the composition, or if I want to look at the way the camera sees this right now, I can shoot this also. And 
it allowed me to record these screens and then play them back and go, wow, for this one I need a 32 or I need to really go wide and I need the 23 millimeter lens. Or if I wanted to get something off in the distance, I could tell what the 90 millimeter lens would do and how it sees. So essentially, you know, this is how it kind of works. So the viewfinder app has become very, very beneficial to me. And you can buy this app and set it up for a number of other different camera systems, whether it be APS-C, Micro Four Thirds, or full frame. Um, I have it set up here and you've got, I can back out and I have preferences built for all my other camera systems. But this is a good way that, you know, if you're doing something without all your camera gear, you can take a picture, find the way you want it, and come back to it later on and know exactly what lens to put on the camera to take the shot. It is a camera that makes you slow down. And I've come to appreciate this camera over the last couple of months that I've had it. I know there are places I'd like to go, and there are places I really kind of know the angles. And so I slow down, I set the shots up, and take my picture. It is, first off, beautifully designed, built like a rock, and you have to really appreciate the file from this and see the file from it to really know what it's capable of doing. 16 stop dynamic range, it's reading the histogram off the raw, um, frame averaging, which is worth the price of admission alone. Uh, there's just so many things to talk about. You know, the ability to do rise and falls and, and shifts over here, um, it just, it feels like a well thought out camera, but the price tag for many is equal to that of a pretty fancy car and then some, especially if you're going to outfit yourself with, you know, say five lenses or so, um, it's probably over 70 to a hundred thousand dollar investment. Um, so got to be aware of that. Now, some people go, well, who would need this with all the different camera systems out there today? Why would somebody want this camera system, you know, $50,000 versus a $10,000 Fuji? Well, you know, those are questions you can ask and wonder, but, you know, why would anybody want a Ferrari or a Lamborghini? It's because they do. It's because they appreciate the art of slowing down. They want the finest quality, the finest engineering possible, and it's a a niche product, no different than uh, Leica and other camera brands uh, that are meant for a small select audience. Yes, I might be somewhat biased because I used to work there and I want to make sure that this is perfectly clear. It's been six plus years since I've been at phase one. I was there for 13 years, did some amazing things, met some amazing people. It's an amazing company, but those days are gone and it's nice to know those people that are still there but it's really nice to actually be a photographer again and photograph with a piece of equipment like this. It'll spoil you, although it's quite different. Remember, there's no viewfinder and things like that. So all I've got to say is that this is a marvelous piece of technology. Everything they do with this, from the packaging that it comes in to the build quality of the lenses and the image resolution of these lenses is just beyond reproach. So phase one, my hat's off to you. The Phase 1 XT camera system, for those that want the finest and the best, and especially the finest image quality that are willing and want to make big prints so they can really appreciate it, this is probably the camera system for you. One of the things that you do get for the price, though, with the Phase 1 XT and XF camera system is a camera that's built for the future. Um, this camera is not one of these kind of cameras that in two years, because you know, there's something new out, uh, that you've got to make a whole new kind of investment. Phase one is always adding to its uh, beta uh, system, meaning they are coming out with a lot of technology that can be put into these backs, and it's part of the phase one labs where you can try out these products ahead of time. The system will grow with you. Um, the files will change. You know, they've done a lot regarding color and profiles and all sorts of other things. And just like their Capture One, they've just added, for example, recently adjustment brushes. Best tool, I mean, it, I've never had so much fun working my pictures. I've never had so much fun taking my pictures as I do with this camera. And as an investor in this camera system, to know that it will grow with me and change, and all I've got to do is upgrade firmware to make it have new capabilities, makes me relax and feel that my money has been well spent. On behalf of myself and Michael Durr, who's behind the camera, I want to say thank you for being part of the PhotoPXL family where we're enhancing your vision every day and working real hard at it. 
we got a lot of fun doing these kind of things and I uh, hope you've liked this camera. It's always nice to be able to sit in the Lamborghini or the Ferrari and look at it even though you'll never own it and hopefully we're giving you a chance to see that today. Thank you very much and uh, we'll catch you on the next video.